Americans sing their national anthem on more occasions and with more passion than any other, than other democratic nation. I mean, it's very, very uh, important to uh, respect your, your flag, respect your national anthem, be very, very proud of it. I don't see that in India. I think there's a, I'm drawing a contrast. I'm explaining the deep American culture where I think it's different from the corresponding deep Indian culture. College departments in classics, history, philosophy emphasize mainly Western civilization. I don't see the equivalent in India of emphasizing Indian civilization. All levels of politics are based on patriotism. I mean, even the far left Ralph Nader will say, I'm a good American, I'm a proud American, America first. I mean, that is very important. Now, some of this is set up to the, to, to make the following points. The postmodernist view is we could say that today at the end of the 20th century as history gives way to the postmodern, we are witnessing the dissolution of the West. This is what some people have said. My position is USA is following a trajectory that is drastically opposite, different from Young's analysis. Not only USA, I mean China is not dissolving, uh, France, England, uh, Russia, I mean they're all into more nationalism than ever before. It is widely accepted that Eurocentrism no longer seems acceptable in a world where others are reasserting their own notions of past and future. My, my counter position is, but acceptable by whom? By a group of college professors who have promulgated these theories and their gullible students. I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a cocoon effect in liberal colleges where they have talked each other and their students into believing that the world has changed and the world has become a certain idealized manner, but it is not really the way the world is. Scholars falsely assume that a new standard of acceptability has spread outside the academy. So the postmodernist popularity is to deconstruct nation states. The nation states are going out of style and they're no good. Deconstruction of dominant identities. All culture is text for deconstruction using trendy theories. My counterposition is that the American grand narrative is deeply embedded in its institution of power and in the white culture. Academics wishfully think, it, think of the disappearance of West, Western grand narratives or geographically bounded nation states. Are academics too invested in their theories? I mean, I just don't see evidence of postmodernism in the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, for example. I think there's just no evidence that they are dissolving themselves. I see no evidence in the Fortune 50 or Fortune 100 saying, hey, you know, it doesn't matter whether you use my brand or my competitor's brand because it's the same thing. It doesn't matter if my market share goes up or down. There's no such thing as the other. There's no competitor. It's all the same. I mean, I just don't see that. If a postmodernist started talking inside the corporate office, they would be fired. I mean, this is, they wouldn't want such a guy around. I mean, I just, I don't see this, uh, this trendiness in Indian intellectualism uh, being, uh, being truly reflective of uh, American society. Is postmodernism for export? Is it, a, is it an export product? Deconstruction ideology failed in American mainstream. It had little impact on American nationalism. It's thriving in liberal academic cocoons and pop culture. By denying the unity of anything, including lived experience, postmodernism is the credo to fragment the third world in an intellectually deep and respectable fashion. Postmodernism softens the targets. Third world intellectuals are a franchise to reproduce for local consumption. Many genuinely believe they're serving the downtrodden. I made some assertions to provoke people to start thinking in a certain way. One of them, and I just sort of list some of the major ones, one of them that contrary to what postmodernist fashion, fashionable theories are claiming, the dominant powers in the world are not going away, their grand narratives are not becoming lighter, nation states are not dissolving, boundaries are not disappearing. This is true for the corporate sector, for the countries as nation states, it's true for religious, organized religion and so forth. So I have a serious problem with those who think that since uh, postmodernism is now kind of a ground reality, India should self-destruct, self-dissolve, self-deconstruct because you know everybody else is doing it. I don't see anybody else doing it. That was an important point. Secondly, the uh, unlike uh, while we understand American pop culture, that does not is not symptomatic of the deeper culture. 
The deeper culture consists of a combination of institutions which give power and continuity <coughs> and even deeper than that is what I call the deep Judeo-Christian culture which is biblical, very biblical, biblical centric and the manifest destiny could be considered the American equivalent of Hindutva or conversely you could say Hindutva is, is an Indian construction of manifest destiny whichever way you want to look at it. And while there is enormous criticism of uh, an Indian grand narrative which is totalizing and so forth, uh, Indians haven't really done the same gazing at the American grand narrative which goes even further back, which has even more power on the world stage and so on. So one of my slides will be to compare the Hindutva grand narrative and the manifest destiny grand narrative and I put columns up later on and tell you something about it. Then I said that besides these internal drivers of America, the, there are some external pressures. There is a clash with China which is based on who is more modern, who has a better industrial complex, who has manufacturing economy of scale and better profit margins and efficiencies and America and America the father is now fighting its son which is very difficult because the son is trained by the father and knows everything the father has to teach. So fighting your own son in modernity and in industry terms is not going to be easy. And the second is the famous clash of civilizations which is between one fundamentalism and another fundamentalism and there too the Islamic fundamentalism is an offspring of uh, Judeo-Christian prophetic traditions. So they've, uh, they've derived a lot of their theologies from that and so uh, in that case too one might say proverbially America is father fighting its own son. So we have a father fighting two sons and neither son wants to quit or give up and this the dad is therefore has a lot of anxiety. So when you look at the internal drivers and these external pressures, uh, these are in the background uh, they operating uh, when you want to look at what, what would the eagle be thinking of India. So then I move to uh, the, the, the point that uh, deconstructing India has become very fashionable, has been exported very successfully to third world intellectuals who differentiate themselves from their peers in their, in their, in their universities or wherever they are working based on how much uh, foreign legitimacy and, and endorsement and how many foreign symbols they have, how many visas they have stamped and how many uh, different kinds of symbols of their association uh, with, with, the, with the West. And this uh, import of ideology into India is of a kind of ideology which is not necessarily consumed domestically. It's sort of an export variety. It's sort of for export only and not necessarily practiced at home. And so this, uh, this led me to the idea that uh, we have uh, the creation of sub-nations, uh, all kinds of sub-nations, fragmented identities in India being given ideological uh, uh, importance uh, by, by intellectuals. Uh, while the nation as a collective entity being given uh, not only less importance but also denigrated and also deconstructed. Uh, so India as India's plight is sandwiched between uh, the South Asianism on the outside putting pressures and sub-nationalism on the inside putting pressures.